All right, so hi everybody. My name is Ken Rosenthal. I'm a park naturalist here at Gulf Branch Nature Center. Just a reminder, I am recording this, so if you don't want to appear on uh, a video that will be posted later, you might want to turn your camera off now. Please definitely keep your microphones off. Um, if you keep your cameras off, it's probably going to help with um, video playback for you as well, because that can eat in the bandwidth. We're going to have a lot of people on, so I appreciate everybody keeping an, an eye on both of those and making sure that they are um, off. All right, so I'm going to get go ahead and get started by sharing my PowerPoint here. Uh, it's easier to find this time. Um, and I hope everybody's with me and understands we're going to be talking about copperheads tonight. <clears throat> So, um, ooh, let's go ahead and mute that mic. Um, we're going to talk about northern copperheads, and I always like to get started, especially when I'm talking about specific um, uh, organisms. I like to get a, a little idea of where we are in the uh, the big old tree of life. So, oops. so um, Snakes are reptiles and they are chordates. Chordates means they have a uh, backbone surrounding their spinal cord. Uh, and I've heard people, I still get people that will try to tell me that snakes don't have a backbone. Here's a nice image of a snake skeleton. And you can see that backbone goes all the way around to the end of that tail. They are very flexible, which I think is sometimes why um, people attribute them to not having backbones. You'll notice they don't have any connective bones between their ribs. Uh, that also allows them to eat a large meal and really extend um, the size of their uh, stomach. Oh, we need a microphone muted, please. There we go. And um, uh, I think because those, those ribs are only connected, I think by connective tissue, but not by bones, like we have the big sternum, the big hard uh, sternum that connects our ribs in the middle, uh, that gives them a little extra ability to be flexible. So chordates, and as I said, they're reptiles, and they're in the order Squamata, which is the snakes and the lizards, and snakes and lizards are very, uh, very closely related. Uh, and they are serpents, uh, and the suborder Serpentes, and we're going to be in the family Viperidae, and specifically the subfamily. Hello, I think your microphone might be muted. We can't hear you. My microphone might be muted? I can hear fine. Is everybody able to hear me? We can put some I thumbs up you. in the chat. We can hear you. Okay. We can hear you. Okay. Coming through clear. Okay. All right. Uh, I'm going to get back at it then. Um, there are, there is a captioning option on here. Um, how well it picks me up and translates and how quickly uh, there is a delay on that, I don't know, but I believe there is a, a captioning option. Um, under more actions and if there's not or if you're having trouble with the audio I apologize uh, like I said I will be I am recording uh, and this will be shared on uh, uh, Facebook and YouTube um, so we are in the subfamily Crotalinae which is the pit vipers uh, and they're called that because on their face they have a heat sensory pit that helps them to detect small levels of uh, uh, small temperature differentials uh, and that really helps them to uh, essentially aim where they're biting helps them get their prey um, these are this is a timber rattlesnake and this is a cottonmouth or water moccasin uh, and they are also part of that um, if i remember correctly the pit vipers are only a new world uh, group that you only find them in uh, north and uh, south america you don't find them anywhere else but the americas and we are talking about a kistrodon contortix which is the uh, northern copperhead, which is the copperhead. Uh, the copperhead is actually broken up into five subspecies. Uh, we'll obviously be talking about the northern copperhead because that's the one uh, we see. Um, of the 32 species of snake found in Virginia, only three are venomous, uh, and I've already mentioned them all. We have the copperhead, the one on the left. That's the one that you'll find here. You can see the range maps at the bottom of these columns. Um, so you've got the copperhead, which is northern Virginia. The Eastern Cottonmouth, and I've had people tell me they've seen, or it's also called a water moccasin. I've had people tell me they've seen these. Uh, these are typically um, not found here. They're found in the southeast corner of Virginia, and they are a swamp or wetland species. Uh, you can't and then hear. Got, oh, really? And then we've got the uh, timber rattlesnake, 
and the timber rattlesnake is found in more mountainous areas. So if you go west of here into mountainous areas or north into some of the mountains in the Virginia area, um, that's where we find the timber rattlesnake. But you'll notice on both and all three of these, the only one that has red in Arlington County is the, uh, the northern copperhead. Um, and you're not going to find it in all of. I thought I had another slide there. You're not going to find it in all of um, Arlington. You're going to find it mostly along in the north. You'll find them here in Gulf Branch Natural Area. You'll find them in Potomac Overlook Regional Park. Uh, they have been seen in Fort C.S. Smith. Uh, you'll find them essentially in the um, rocky forested hillsides along the Potomac. Uh, so South Arlington, you shouldn't be running into them as much as you will, uh, as, as much as you might around here. Um, so copperheads emerge from I got somebody with the mic on. I can hear myself talking. I have to use my phone for the audio, and I can't turn my volume up on the phone. We tried this the other day. Uh, there should be a, a mic option where you can shut the mic off at least. So you're just hearing me, but not hearing. We won't be hearing your, your background. Do what? So. Um, copperheads emerge from brumation in late spring. Brumation is an, brumation is an important distinction. Um, there are different ways uh, that animals go through winter uh, be, to be inactive during winter. Hibernation is specifically marked by uh, a drastic temperature change in essentially ectotherms, which are animals that don't, um, that is not healthy for them, for their temperature to change as much. Uh, or I'm sorry, in endotherms, warm-blooded animals. Um, and most and a lot of mammals don't do it. Uh, I think it's also uh, categorized by uh, producing a certain kind of fat to help make it through the winter as well. Um, copperheads are ectotherms are cold blooded, so their body temperature just does change uh, throughout the day from being you know, uh, cool overnight to, to warmer during the day, especially depending on you know if they're out basking or if they're um, trying to get away from the heat so they don't overheat. Um, so brumation is uh, the uh, period of inactivity um, that uh, reptiles uh, and amphibians go through in the winter. So when they're when they're done brumating, and, and um, you might see garter snakes, say March, or early April. Um, but I, I've seen garter snakes here in March. Copperheads are usually late April, maybe mid May before you start seeing them. We have seen them in the park, so they're definitely here now. Again, we're in mid June, um, but they are a little later later arrival during spring than than, than some other snakes. Uh, and I got a note here that they're semi-social. Um, copperheads will uh, den together and uh, sometimes even in hibernacula where you might have, you know, uh, tens, uh, dozens, uh, maybe even hundreds of copperheads in a hibernacula. Um, and they sometimes will also uh, tolerate more than one copperhead in their basking areas. Uh, so they can be semi-social. They tend to hunt uh, and live mostly by themselves. Um, in some of the western areas where you find copperheads, they are, they have been uh, observed uh, denning up with other venomous snakes, including some uh, rattlesnakes, uh, so other snakes as well. Um, garter snakes, oops, back on the screen here. Garter snakes are, um, some species of garter snakes will also do this. These are red-sided garter snakes. I believe this is uh, possibly Montana or Idaho. Um, there's a really famous hibernacula of these snakes up in uh, Manitoba in Canada, um, where there's a whole park dedicated to preserving the area where you'll have hundreds or thousands of these snakes in these limestone sinks underground and they come out en masse in uh, the spring and it's just amazing. If you like that many snakes, if not, um, then maybe it's not your cup of tea. Um, and this is uh, the range map, so I want to talk a little bit about that. You can see you know, here's the Chesapeake, so we're definitely in the range here. But like I said, oh, did I do it here? Yep, I did it here. Sorry. Uh, but like I said, not all of Arlington is actually um, places where you'll find copperheads. This is a uh, an observation map from a, a website called iNaturalist, which is a citizen, a nice citizen science tool. If you haven't seen it, I suggest checking it out. Uh, I really enjoy it. It's a lot of fun. These blue markers here are copperhead sightings in Arlington. I searched for all copperhead sightings in Arlington, as you can see. Um, this is maybe this is Windy Run. I'm just see this. These look like they're along the uh, Potomac Heritage Trail. Um, here's one in a neighborhood. These are clustered around Donaldson Run and Potomac Overlook. I think probably more Potomac Overlook. And these are Gulf Branch uh, Natural Area. So you can see um, in Arlington, if you want to see copperheads, you've got to come up north here. You know, either our area 
um, Potomac Overlook walk along uh, the Potomac um, if you were looking for copperheads. Um, they are common in the area. There are other places, Great Falls. Um, one of my first times visiting there, first thing I saw was a sign warning me that there are copperheads in the park. Um, so they are out and about. Now, the kind of habitat these guys choose, um, this is something new for me. I was really surprised because they've always pushed the rocky wooded uh, forested areas. And um, they can be found in a range of habitats from you know terrestrial to semi-aquatic, which means you know everything from, from woods and even montane slopes down to wetlands. Um, one of the things I read is that they, they seem to prefer ecotones. An ecotone is a transition area between two habitats. Um, and they're very tolerant, uh, more so than other snakes, of habitat alteration. Uh, garter snakes are uh, another good example of this. But, um, you know, if there's an area within their range that has ample sunlight and also cover, you know, there's a fairly good chance. I, I read a lot of accounts of um, some industrial sites, you know, places where a lot of stuff was dumped you know um they have been found in suburban areas i know some uh, many of our neighbors have told me stories of finding them in their yards um so they do not shy away necessarily from from human habitation um obviously they don't want to be seen by us you know we are a large scary predator to them um but they don't shy away from being around areas that have people um And they are very good at camouflage. I think sometimes this is one of the things that really makes people anxious is, is how good these snakes are at camouflaging. Uh, this is the body of the snake. The head's way over here. Trust me, I, I, this is a zoom lens. I wasn't as close as it looks. Um, but they do have a fantastic pattern for camouflage, for hiding in a leaf litter, especially when they sit still. Um, this is one in uh, the Gulf Branch area here. They will, and then this one's on the move. They will sit coiled up, they'll hang out near uh, areas that are well trafficked by small mammals, like a small, like a game trail, uh, and they will sit and wait uh, ambush style for their food to come by, and then they will bite it, envenomate it, uh, and track it down until it succumbs to the venom uh, and then eat it. Um, so they're, somebody was asking me how aggressive they are, and I don't consider them aggressive, but sometimes I've approached a copperhead and it hasn't bothered to move. Where most other snakes, if I see it and I get too close, psh, they're gone. This guy will sit there, um, and I don't know if that's a, you know, they're thinking that they're well camouflaged, or if they're just like, yeah, sure, buddy, get closer, see what happens. I can never tell. Uh, I'm never entirely sure what that feeling is, but um, they are not aggressive. They won't necessarily go after you, but they they will bite to defend themselves. And we'll talk more about that later. Um, sometimes when they sun themselves, they are not very camouflaged. This is a uh, copperhead in the garden. Um, this, per this person did spot this copperhead well in advance. It was easy to, to see, obviously. Um, but in other times when they are, uh, and again, this guy was basking. He was in full sunlight, so he was he was warming up, or she. Uh, it's a large, it seems like a large copperhead, so maybe a she. But um, they will, you know, bask in the sunlight to, to warm up, uh, as most snakes do. Um, and they can be active during the day, although they tend to be more nocturnal, especially the warm. When you get in a really warm part of the summer, uh, they're more nocturnal. Um, I, I, and again, I'm not trying to scare anybody. I will walk out with my cell phone flashlight on. If I'm like tonight, I'll be leaving at night and it's humid and it's warm. I will have my cell phone flashlight out when I walk out to my car just to make sure that the sticks are sticks and the shadows are shadows uh, on my way out there. Um, and like I said, that, that was mentioned there, ambush prey. The youngsters have a... Um, I'm never entirely sure if everybody can see my cursor or not, but they have this yellow tip to the tail and they can use that as a lure for small critters. S these small copperheads will eat um, small insects. Um, I, I read that they do uh, like caterpillars, but they will go after, you know, small vertebrates as well. Uh, and then the bigger snakes can eat bigger vertebrates, including, you know, small rodents. Um, and like I said, the youngsters use this, this tail in their lure to kind of attract their prey in to get close enough for them to bite it. see. I felt like there was something else I was going to say about what they eat. Maybe I'll remember it. I'll come back. Um, they are ovoviviparous. That's a big fancy word. And essentially what that means is after the female mates, um, she produces eggs. She keeps the, the, the young inside her body. So even though they're developing in an egg, they're developing inside the, um, the female's body. So they do get gas exchange from her, but it is not the same as the placenta that acts as an exchange of, of everything between um, the mother and the, uh, 
the unborn child in um, mammals, unborn uh, young in mammals. So they will mate. Actually, they can mate twice a year. Uh, they they would may mate in the spring, or they will mate in the fall. Um, if they mate in the spring, youngsters are usually born. The juvenile copperheads are usually born um, around here. It would be mid to late August, maybe early September, uh, and they're small. The um, and again, it's a live birth, so they're developing inside mother's body. And when she gives birth, they're not hatching from an egg. They're coming out. Uh, they're coming out alive, ready to go. They've got their venom, they've got their fangs, um, and they are all set to to go ahead and hunt. I think they might stay together, like in this picture, maybe for a little bit, but for not for very long. Um, and I believe I read that the range can be from like three to 14 young, although it seems more typical to be anywhere between three and five uh, young at a time. So they're not very productive uh, as a, uh, uh, as far as reproduction goes, they do have you know some numbers, but not a lot of numbers. I do remember what I was going to say on this picture, so I'm going to go back for a second. Oh, uh, one of the things they do like to eat is insects. Uh, and I was talking with our natural resource manager today, Alonzo Abogadas, and he mentioned how during um, brood years, when you have an emergence of the periodical cicadas, the black ones with the orange wings and the really bright red eyes, the uh, young copperheads really, really love to eat them. Uh, and so for any co of these young copperheads that are born late this summer, they have a bonanza. If they can survive the winter, if they find a good place to, to hibernate over the winter uh, and can survive into early summer next year, they will um, have a bonanza of food because the cicadas uh, don't sting, they don't bite, they all they can do is fly. And so they don't have a lot of defenses uh, and their biggest defense is we've got so many of us, you can't stop us from reproducing. Uh, and so any animals that do eat those cicadas are going to have a, a bumper crop of a year uh, next year when they emerge. Um, it won't be good for next year's um, crop of copperhead youngsters because they will be born after the emergence of the cicadas, which is usually May or June. It's much it's earlier in the year than the actual um, typical uh, time when the young uh, copperheads come out. And then the other thing I want to say is if they mate in the fall, um, the female can store uh, the male sperm and hold it for later. So throughout the winter um, before uh, essentially she can allow herself to, um, I guess, get pregnant, if you will, uh, before she will actually use, utilize the male sperm to 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 make new young. Uh, and so she can store it if she's mating in the fall, because obviously winter times or very early spring is not a good time for copperheads to have to have young. Um, the males will occasionally if you I, I I've always seen this as the pictures of the male uh, rattlesnakes which will rise up and they'll push and they'll, they'll battle each other. Oh, that was really loud. Uh, will rise up and push each other. Um, copperhead males will do that vying for a female. Um, sometimes a male will approach a female and she will go up into that stance and they will push each other as well. Uh, and I was reading a researcher who said that uh, if the male doesn't succeed in overpowering the female, he will skulk away. He will not mate with the female. And sometimes that day he's just like, yeah, well, that was my chance this year. And he doesn't try to mate again uh, during the season. Um, and then they will turn to brewmate in mid to late fall. One of my really favorite facts about uh, snakes and some other cold blooded animals that do the same thing, uh, but snakes especially will do this, um, is they will start, uh, they will stop eating maybe in early autumn, maybe even late summer, uh, but they will continue defecating to essentially empty their digestive tract, their stomach, uh, their intestines, get all that food material out because once they go into brumation, they are not able to digest. So it does them no good to fatten up. They do essentially the exact opposite of something like a, a black bear or a woodchuck. Um, it is thought that, you know, if there is still food material in their gut, it could, um, you know, rot or ferment and, and poison the snake. Uh, and so this is uh, an, an adaptation ahead of that. I can tell you our copperhead here at the Nature Center, somewhere in <laughs> mid-September and mid-October, will stop eating and doesn't eat for three or four months uh, as if it is going through rumation uh, and how it figures the time out because um, it doesn't really have a good view of the outdoors. I don't know what triggers that, but it does go through uh, several months of not eating before 
Uh, it'll start eating sometime in mid spring. Um, so and these, and then again, these guys will do it. So it might not be till mid October or early November before they go in for brumation, but weeks before that, they will have stopped eating uh, in order to make sure that they have um, completely emptied their digestive tract so they don't have any food in there uh, when they do brumate. Hey, Ken, we have a quick question. Yes. Um, Folks are wanting to know if the copperhead population in Arlington is decreasing, increasing, or remaining steady. I don't know that we have the data on that. Um, I, feel like, I feel like there's been a lot of conversation about copperheads this year. Um, and I feel like last year, I you know, heard a lot of people were seeing them. I think they are probably, the population here is healthy. I can't say if there's going to be more or less, um, but I do think it is a fairly healthy population. Um, I moved one uh, from the stream side about a week and a half ago because it's an area where a lot of people visit the stream. Um, and I, it's the first time I've ever seen a copperhead down near the stream. I was really surprised. Um, but I went ahead and moved it and it still had a little bit of yellow on the underside of its tail, which probably meant that this was its second summer, um, maybe third um, or second full summer, because um, usually within a year they lose that yellow color on their tail. It was, a, it was a good size snake. I showed it to maybe 20, 30 people that were going by because I want to make sure everybody can identify a copperhead like I have on the screen. Uh, were there any other questions, Maddie, before I keep going? No, okay. Um, but yes, I don't know about numbers, but they're they're out there. It's a part of our ecosystem. We don't, we'll move them to a, you know, try to move them out of a high traffic area, but generally we don't, you know, remove them from the park. Um, and I, I appreciate when people do tell us, especially if it's in an area where there is, a lot of traffic. Uh, they're a natural part of the ecosystem and, and ideally, you know, if we don't bother them, they won't bother us. So how do I identify a copperhead? How do I know if the snake that I'm seeing is really something I should be worried about? Um, there's a, a lot of ways to talk about this. I've gotten a lot of advice uh, in my earlier years about how to do this. Um, to me, the best and, and single most important diagnostic uh, field mark you're going to look for is these dark bands. Copperheads, copperheads, excuse me, have a uh, alternating dark and light sequence of bands uh, on their dorsal side of their body on the back. And if you'll notice, the bands um, narrow towards the spine or the top of the snake. So as the as the bands uh, approach the spine, they get narrower and they'll produce. I, I've seen everywhere from, you know, choose whichever inanimate object makes you feel better. I've heard people call them saddlebags. I've heard people call them hourglasses. I've heard people call them dumbbells, um, which I kind of like, but I, to me, they're not very dumbbellish. I like to go with um, uh, saddlebags has always kind of been my favorite. So they widen towards the belly. They narrow towards the spine. There is not another snake around in Arlington that's going to have that pattern. So that right there is really good. You will occasionally notice spots in the base of the of the um, the band here, or sometimes in between the dark bands, you'll see a spot as well. Um, this you, again, you may or may not see. It's kind of an individual snake. I, I don't know if you remember the first slide, uh, my title slide. There's a much darker copperhead individual. These are both snakes that were found here, very different coloration, just like you know, uh, different humans. We we cue so much on our um, on these facial features that are so important to us because how we communicate and and, um, and you know get along. Um, and sometimes it's hard to see what marks an individual in different species like this. Um, but they're just like us. You know, there's individuals that have wider bands, darker bands, lighter bands. Um, just like we have different color hair, different color eyes, different shaped noses and chins. Um, so you'll you'll notice some variation on this, but but definitely um, that dark, those dark bands. Uh, and they don't always connect. That's also important too. Don't expect them to connect. So sometimes they don't, sometimes they do. And there's another one that doesn't. There's another one that does. So um, you'll see that both, but they're always narrowest along the spine. If you look at it from the side, oh, here we go. Here's you. This is the, the one I moved there. Um, about 10 days ago. This is one from a year or two ago. You can see this one on the bottom is much darker. To me, the background is much darker than uh, the one at the top, um, but they both have roughly the same pattern. And uh, in this one, you can see there's spots in between uh, the dark the dark bands. But look for the Hershey's Kisses. Um, I think almost everybody knows the Hershey Kisses. Uh, it's a very uh, definitive shape, and you're going to see that from the side. Um, I didn't even bother with the belly because if you're <laughs> if you're messing with the belly of the copperhead, you've got other issues than whether that snake is actually copperhead at that point. Um, 
So the Hershey Kisses, and then again, the bands in your spine. Those are the best field marks. You can see them from further away. That's why I started with those. Some less helpful hints or tips, uh, and that's because you have to be a little bit closer to the snake for these, um, is the color and shape of the head. They can have a coppery head, although I've seen variations in how coppery, quote, that head looks, and that can also be a, a, an effect of the atmospheric light. You know, is it cloudy? Is it rainy? Is it sunny? And that might affect how you see that color as well. Um, or the triangular head. I do feel that the snake's head is definitely definably different from its neck, that you can definitely see where that head widens uh, and it, where you can see the, the delineation of the head and the neck and the rest of the body of the snake. Um, one thing I don't hear enough people say about, but I, I've noticed this on, on most copyrights I see, at least around here, there's these two little spots on the back of the head. Um, and I wouldn't use it again. I, it's a small mark, but if you see that, that's pretty good. You'll actually see there's another snake that sometimes has this, but so many other markings on the back of his head as well. It's not as as obvious as this one where you've got this this one mostly single color on the back of the snake's head except for these two dark spots. Um, this is the one I always get is slit pupils. Absolutely. Slit pupils are are diagnostic. You got to be kind of close to the snake to see that again, depending on the light and where the snake is. So you know, maybe leave that one for if you've got binoculars, um, but they do have a slit pupil instead of a round pupil. They have this heat sensory pit right here uh, in between the nostril and the eye. Uh, and they have two color tones. This is kind of a neat one uh, I, I hadn't really thought about, but uh, again, something else that uh, our natural resource manager, Alonzo, told me about is you can see it's a darker tone on the back and then along the mouth, it's a much lighter tone. So they get this two-tone head uh, from the side that really stands out. Um, if you've got a juvenile copperhead, if you see a small snake and you think it's a copperhead, the most important thing you can look for, because you can see those two little spots there, this is a cell phone picture, so it's not great, but you see the two little spots there, you see the coppery head, it's a little different color from the rest of the snake, but I want you to look at the tail. Their tail has a very bright tip to it, which they can use as a lure. I mentioned this in an earlier slide. If you don't see that tail um, brightly colored tail, you probably don't have a baby copperhead. If you've got a baby snake and it looks like the tail's been chopped off, well then you got to look for these dark bands. But again, even on the uh, the um, juvenile copperhead here, dark bands, narrowest along the spine, widest towards the belly. Okay, There's no big blotches or spots. It's a continuous dark band all the way across. And maybe it stops in the middle, uh, but you'll see another continuation part, partly on the end, but there aren't blotches, they aren't spots. Uh, most of the other patterned snakes around here have a couple rows of blotched, blotches or spots, and so that sets them apart. But that tip of the juvenile's tail is, is very, uh, very important. Um, the single, the one snake that's probably mistaken most for copperheads is a northern water snake. Um, I'm going to say this even though I just said that you can't find copperheads in wetlands. If you see a big fat bodied snake with some bands resting on a rock near the water, there's a probably 90 to 99% chance that that is a northern water snake. If you don't know, don't touch it. It's the best thing I can tell you. If you're not sure whether your snake is venomous, whether your snake is dangerous, don't touch it. I'll tell you what, if you grab one of these water snakes, they're not venomous, but they'll give you a pretty good bite uh, and they have a, a type of anticoagulant in their saliva that might make you bleed a little extra bit. Not gushers or anything life-threatening, but it might take a little while for those punctures to stop flowing. Um, what I do want you to look at as far as identification is dark bands that widen towards the spine. Okay, so these dark bands are showing up in the exact opposite uh, configuration of the, the copper head. I think, and again, these are two very different individuals. This is a picture from Reston. This is from our uh, big pool on the other side of military. I have no idea what these guys were eating because the only fish we have in the stream are eels, but if they're finding eels, all the power to them. We had a couple of big water snakes that sat out there um, a summer or two ago on that big rock wall on the south side of the stream next to the, uh, the, the little pump plant there. Um, but if you put them together, you can see narrowest along the spine, fattening out towards the belly right here. The dark bands are widest at the spine and they narrow towards the belly. Complete opposite. Um, you could probably let me get a little closer here. You know, if you're looking at the head, there's that two tone head of the copper head on the left and the slit pupil. You got a round pupil in the water snake. 
and it kind of looks like it has a two-tone head, but what you'll notice in all these scales around the mouth is one edge of the scale's got a dark line to it. Okay, and that's really important because it's really outlining the scales. When you see all these individual scales outlined in those dark lines, that's a, a water snake, it's not a copperhead. You don't see that on the copperhead at all. It's a pretty, um, I don't want to say uniform color, but you don't see any of the edges of the scales outlined uh, with dark bands. And finally, from the top of the head, I feel like you can really see um, the distinction between the head and the neck here. Uh, it's a little, it, it's not, it's not that you can't see it on the water snake, but it's not as obvious. Uh, and again, there's those two little spots on the back of the copperhead's uh, body. But again, if you stick with the bands, you're good to go. Because by the time you get this close to the head, hopefully you've seen the bands by now and you know which snake you're dealing with. Um, before I continue, the reason I'm, uh, I'm mentioning this is not because I'm, I want to make sure you pet all the snakes that aren't copperheads. The reason I'm mentioning this is I often get a phone call or an email that says, hey, here's a snake I found in my backyard. Is this a copperhead? And I go, no, it's a water snake or it's a, like here you'll see a juvenile eastern rat snake. And they go, oh, well, I killed it anyways. So if I can save a few snakes lives, especially you know ones that aren't copperheads, um, I'm hoping that I can help these snakes out. Um, the eastern rat snake is our longest snake. It can get up to six feet. Um, I've seen seven, I've seen six, I'll go with six, uh, which is 72 inches, it's longer than me. Uh, they're a large black snake. If you see them in the light, you will see that they actually do have a pattern, but they're so melanistic that their colors that went very dark. This is what a young rat snake looks like. It's not a little black snake, it is a very beautifully patterned uh, brown snake with light, uh, a light brown background and dark brown blotches along the, um, the spine and a row on either side not bands whoops I thought I had an arrow pop up and tell you that not bands okay uh if you also look at the head of the eastern rat snake you can see there's like a dark band between the eyes I, I have seen that I think on every juvenile rat snake I've seen and their eyes actually really stand out as a round a round pupil um so again juvenile rat snake not a copperhead. Here's a juvenile copperhead. You can really see that green tail color on, on this one. This is a really nice picture because um, it was taken by a professional photographer. Um, and that is a, a really beautiful tail. This guy, if you were to go down to the end of his tail, doesn't have that. OK, um, and that's really helpful. And again, bands, blotches. Um, Northern Black Racer. I, I feel like we're in the range. I don't know that we see these as often in Arlington. They're very similar as adults to uh, rat snakes. Uh, and as juveniles, they're very similar to juvenile rat snakes. They have a, a, you know, a couple rows of splotches on the back, not bands, not a copperhead. Uh, you also see blotches or spots, not bands. Tails are not brightly colored. This is uh, on the right here, a decays brown snake. They are non-venomous. They are um, don't get much bigger than 12, 13 inches. I mean, that's a max. They're a very small stake. They will bite. They will bluff bite at you, but I'm not even sure that their teeth can puncture our skin because they're so tiny. They will also musk uh, and uh, expel some feces at you. They're happy to poop on your hand if you pick them up, and it does stink. I can tell that from experience. Um, the kids never want to give me five after picking one up during a program. Um, but they are non-venomous. These are two, this is, especially this, this, this brown thing. I get this one a lot too with copperheads. Again, no bands, it's just spots. So it's definitely not um, a copperhead. It does not have that brightly colored tail. Um, the Eastern garter snake is uh, hopefully not often confused with a, um, a copperhead. You see this guy actually had a, a, some kind of meal here. Uh, before I got to take this picture. They have this yellow stripe running the length of their body, which pretty much you're not going to see. Whoops, I don't want to show that yet, uh, which pretty much you're not going to see on a copperhead. They don't have any bands, but they have this checkered pattern. Uh, and there's a lot of variability. Uh, the individuals along the Chesapeake have a really beautiful pattern. Uh, it's a little bit different th than this here. But what I wanted to see is this guy is um, not happy with me. Uh, it's started to coil up a little bit into a defensive posture, and that head it is really flattened. They'll flatten out their body, 
the flatten up the head. I've seen some garter snakes that really get into this as if they're going for an Academy Award. Now, they're trying to get you to think that they are larger and they are scarier, and they're doing this bluff bite. Now, unlike the brown snake, garter snakes can give you a pretty good bite. Uh, you know, they do have teeth, um, especially the, the, the bigger adults can um, not, again, not, you know, go to the hospital horrible, but they can give you a, a nice snake. Uh, any snake bite needs to be uh, washed and cleaned to make sure that you don't have a lot of bacteria and you don't get an infection from it. Um, but I want you to see here is here's another um, garter snake and hopefully you can see that that head is not nearly as flat as the one here that's upset. This guy was getting ready to do it, but he hadn't uh, hadn't done it yet. Uh, and so there's not a lot of not as, as big a market difference between the head and the neck. Um, another one that does this, I don't know if we have them around here, we do have them in Northern Virginia, is the hognose snake, which can really make themselves really flatten out, almost look cobra-like because they can get really wide uh, along the head and neck. Uh, and that is a common bluff for many snakes that are non-venomous. Uh, so I'm going to spend a, a few minutes here talking about venomous, non-venomous, and hopefully I can give you guys a, um, a chance to ask some questions. Um, I sit next to the copperhead cage at the Nature Center and I hear when we're open, when we've been open on probably two or three times a week, oh, here's a poisonous copperhead. So I'm going to give you the quick and dirty right here. Poisonous is when you bite something and you get sick. Venomous is when something bites you and you get sick. So poison is ingested, venom is injected. Um, you can be poisonous and venomous. Uh, that's certainly uh, a possibility, um, but poisonous things tend to be things like mushrooms, you know, frogs and toads uh, that can be distasteful, where venom is more like um, things that are, uh, that can bite you. Snakes, um, all spiders are venomous, and I'll talk about that. Hopefully I'll remember to mention that again when I talk about the venomous snakes here in a second. Um, you can get it by stinging. Most stinging insects have venom. When you get that, you know, that the bee sting's painful and you get a, a little bump, um, that's the venom. And for for a lot of us, it's not medically serious. For some, uh, some of us, it very much is because we have an allergy to it. But that is the venom. You're being envenomated by a honeybee when it stings you or uh, any other stinging insect. You're, you, you, you might be getting envenomated. Uh, and then uh, my last, this is my favorite, by spur. Um, there are not a lot of venomous mammals, but the platypus is one of them. The males and females both have spurs. The males are the, are the only ones that have a venom in their spur. Um, and I've seen, you know, some fairly painful looking pictures of people who have been on the wrong end of that spur uh, of a platypus. Um, and again, like I said, poison is injected. There is a, a group of snakes called the keelback snakes. Um, and the food that they feed on, I'm trying to remember, I think it's a kind of toad. And the, the toxins from the toad it's actually accumulate in their body. And so the keelback snakes are actually... Um, uh, poisonous, but they're also mildly venomous because they do use venom to catch their prey. Um, so they are one of the snakes that can say that. Um, there is a population of uh, garter snakes in Oregon that I read about that are um, distasteful or even poisonous because they feed on rough skin newts uh, and they accumulate toxin from the newts. Uh, and so that gives them um, uh, a, a poisonous nature. But again, they're fairly, you know, brightly colored, so maybe that helps them out. Um, so, yeah, yeah, go ahead. We've had a few questions. Before we go any further, I want to get them answered. Um, folks are wondering how many species of snake we have in Arlington, and I could not remember off the top of my head. How many species? I can't off the top of my head either. It's less than 32. Because <laughs> uh, many of those species, I'm going to go to Alonzo Abogadis's, uh Reptiles and Amphibians of the Washington, D.C. and Metropolitan Area. Let's see if he at least says uh, that. Um, it might even be half, because there's some that are really specialized. Um, oh, he doesn't, I can't find it quickly. There's no, Virginia has 30 native species, of which 19 could potentially be found locally. So that's not too bad. So maybe two thirds of those. Um, um, so there you go. Was there another question or was it yeah, just that one? Two more sure. questions. Um, sure. One was about the coloration of the copperheads' tails when they're babies. We were wondering. Okay. Um, what causes that? And I said, you know, they're born that way, but I don't know what biological processes make that bright color possible. Oh, yeah. and I don't either. Um, what that coloration comes from, and, and then obviously it fades away. Um, 
That's a really good question, and somebody just gave me homework, so thank you, because I got to find that out. But I don't know what chemical or um, you know if there's a, if it's a pigment or if it's something else, what causes that? But that's a really good question. And then we had a question um, wondering what is a spur when you were referring to the platypus and how they are venomous. Um, okay. Uh, you can look that up. It's 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 like a, a small, almost like a spike. It looks like a small spike, and it's on the inside of their rear legs. And I, I feel like the males use that to hold on to the female, which seems like a really bad idea. Um, but they do have they do have that spike, and it's again, it's in it's on it on the uh, the rear legs, uh, and they can give a good thrashing with it when they get there. If you look up, uh, do a, a Google image search for platypus spur. Uh, and check it out and you should get some really quick and easy pictures. I don't want to get too derailed on the platypus, but it, it's really neat that it's one of those venomous mammals. Uh, and I'm writing down copperhead tail color to figure out before I forget. So I can look that up. Um, so I don't want to alarm anybody because I put this up and then I didn't get to, to finish my spiel, but I want to answer those questions. So that's good. Um, the copperhead is not actually the only venomous snake in Arlington. It is the only venomous snake that is medically serious to humans. Um, and this is where I want to mention spiders. I get asked all the time, does that spider bite? And I feel like that question is, does the spider bite, you know, is it going to hurt? Is it venomous or poisonous? And then I mentioned it's venomous. And, you know, and I think the hidden question is, can it make me really sick or kill me? Um, all spiders are venomous. Not all spiders have a venom that's going to affect you. So a lot of times when we talk about things that are venomous, um, you, you really got to look into what that word means because um, I mentioned that copperheads are the only venomous snake in Northern Arlington and I lied. But when I say that, what I'm really saying is copperheads are the only medically serious venomous snake in Arlington. The other ones that can give can bite us to the point where uh, we should get medical treatment for it. Um, I've read some accounts of garter snakes biting people where they've had a low grade swelling around the area or a little bit of irritation beyond just ouch, I got bit, there's puncture wounds and a little bit of blood on my hand. Um, and it, it has been found recently with, within the last couple of decades that garter snakes uh, do have a little bit of, of, of venom, that they have a gland that produces a mild venom, um, which isn't really for us, it's more for um, small vertebrates or invertebrates. Uh, just like this guy here, this is the uh, the one on the right, it's the ringneck snake. One of my favorite snakes because every August we find these babies in our um, nature center basement because I think there's a mama ringneck snake somewhere that really likes to sit somewhere on the base of our nature center or gets somehow gets under our nature center and gives a, a live birth. These both these snakes are also oviviparous, which means again they produce the eggs but hold them inside their body. Um, the ringneck snake can't even bite us. They're all about musking and pooping on you. They don't even have teeth that are big enough to puncture your skin and they won't even try to bite you, but they will must to get you to let them go. Uh, they are, again, mildly venomous. The venom is, to, is more for invertebrates uh, than it would be for us. So even if they could bite us, it's very, very unlikely that they would, that it would uh, make us sick. I think I read one account of that. I'm not entirely sure how much of that I believe. Um, because the, the high end of length for a ringneck snake is two feet, but I, I have not seen one that's close to that. And they're, they're a beautiful snake. That's one that if you can get a close look at, I highly recommend. Um, LD50 is a way of talking about the median lethal dose. And this is in terms of, of human biology. I don't want to get too stuck on this, but if, if you read about venomous snakes at some point, you'll read about this, this um, dosage here. And it's uh, kind of a way of giving an idea of, of how, um, venomous or potent the venom is. There's a lot of factors to consider uh, in envenomation though. Um, yeah, let me, let me go here. What, some of the factors that can determine that severity, and this is not a complete list, is the amount that they actually inject, the location of the bite, where they bite. Um, you know, a, a copperhead bite on an ankle is, is, is painful. Um, and it can take a while, you know, take a little bit to heal, but it, it's usually not life threatening. But if you've got a copperhead that bites a, a small uh, child, if you got a copperhead that bites an, an elderly adult, if you got a copperhead that bites somebody who's in a compromised immune system, and especially if they bite them somewhere close to a vital organ, like an abdominal bite or even on the face or neck, um, that's a it's, it's a really serious um, bite and you need to get medical attention right away. Uh, so that location can really dictate how uh, severe the, the reaction and, and the medical consequences of the bite can be. Um, 
Oh, I just said the age and condition of the person and then the time to treatment. Um, you know, I'm here at the nature center. I get bit by uh, a copperhead. I know where Virginia Hospital Center is. That's where I'm going. OK, you know, if you're out in the wilderness, and you get bit by a venomous snake, then you, you got a whole different set of problems there, especially if it's not a copperhead. Um, and I'll talk about that in a second. Uh, dry bites are um, have been found uh, copperheads. I think water moccasins and maybe even some of the rattlesnakes will actually dry bite. And what that means is uh, an older snake will recognize on some level, and it, it's still a lot of this is instinctual, so it's not as, as rational or as reasoned as we would do it, but we'll recognize they're about to bite you. You are not a prey. They are not going to eat you. You are a predator. So the bite is the deterrent. The venom certainly doesn't hurt as far as deterring the, the predator from coming back, um, but it's metabolically wasteful to bite a person that you're not going to eat or a large animal that you're not going to eat and inject with a bunch of venom that your body has to produce because now you're reducing what you do have to use to catch prey in the future. Uh, and again, that's a very well-reasoned argument. Snakes aren't sitting there thinking and, and going through it and, you know, pluses and minuses and checks and balances for all that. Um, but um, one of the things people will talk about is whether a Young copperhead. I've heard people tell me this all the time. Ah, you gotta watch out for the young copperheads because they'll bite you and they, they just can't control their their venom. And that is true, but it's more complicated than that. If a young copperhead bites you, they've got less venom to inject. So uh, a young copperhead just releasing its entire store of venom into your ankle might be very different from an adult copperhead giving you a bite on that same ankle, where they. Um, you know, the adult copperhead can certainly deliver more venom and it can be more of an injurious bite. So um, that can, the, the idea that uh, a young copperhead won't control its venom or, or what it um, releases is not entirely inaccurate, but that it'll be a more severe bite is um, is in question. Uh, and remember, they're, they're smaller critter and they're trying to catch small stuff and um, they want to, you know, really survive that first a uh, year or two where they're they're much smaller than the, the adult. And so, you know, in fully envenomating uh, any prey that you get is really an advantage to uh, getting a meal. All right, so we're back to this again. I, I, I don't want to get... Yeah, 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 go ahead. Sure. Um, my bell is wondering if all small snakes are venomous. And I'm not sure if he means all young, or they mean all young snakes or all small in size snakes. But I think it would be good to clear that up. Okay. okay. Um, all small snakes. So not all snakes are venomous. We are just what we're discovering is some snakes have venom that we didn't realize because it's not medically serious to us, so it wasn't really paid attention to. I think just within the last two or three decades, we they discovered that there is um, a venom in the saliva glands of Komodo dragons, which are really big, and you think hey, I don't need venom. Um, and for a while, they thought their bite was just full of a lot of bacteria, but there is an actual. Uh, venom in there, uh, and that's just a, a recent discovery. Um, when, when you talk about the evolution of a of venom, you had a lot of larger snakes living in the forest, and when snakes moved from the forest into, if they, you know, if during that time you had species that converted into a grassland um, where you couldn't just sit and wait for something to combine, you had to be more active a hunter. Uh, being a smaller snake is it's easier to move than being a larger snake. What you lose though is that ability to then grab something and squeeze it. And so the thought is that for snakes that may have moved out of the forest into the grasslands, um, they eventually develop these, you know, saliva and then ultimately teeth to deliver the saliva that was um, you know, medically serious to their prey and could debilitate them. So if you had a particularly potent saliva, you were more likely to feed and more likely to reproduce, and that's how you got more snakes that had this venomous saliva. Um, do all small snakes have venom? Absolutely not. You know, some small snakes, you know, their their way of protecting themselves is, is hiding and ducking under cover. You know, some, uh, there are, ven you know, most venomous snakes will bite in corner, but every snake's going to most every snake is going to try to bite if cornered. You know, that's it's a last defense. Um, if you can yell at somebody and get them to leave you alone, that's much better than having to throw down and, and get into a fight because then you can both get hurt. You know, it's the same with a prey predator interaction for these snakes. If they can bluff or musk or get you to leave them alone um, before they have to bite, they will. I can tell you from, uh, from uh, experience, our copperhead stinks 
when I go in there with the snake hook and try to move it around so I can get to the water dish, it will musk and it is funky. I've, heard, I've seen people talk, it says it smells like apricots or cucumber. No, not, no, it, it doesn't. It's, it's, it's a funk. So they, they will musk. That's, it's a way to get uh, people to leave them alone. Uh, I hope I answered your question. If that wasn't your question, if you want to um, try it again, please do. And there'll be some time at the end too. Um, so I didn't want to get mired in these bar charts too much, but what I wanted you to see what I wanted you to see was the yellow and the red are the venom yield, the low and high range of how much venom they can inject. And you can see for the cottonmouth and the timber rattlesnake, they're very high maximum yields. What's not, um, I, I don't like these graphs because the red and the yellow, the higher you go, the more serious it can be. For the black, the lower it goes, the more serious it can be. And I think that's a little misleading because the black is the estimated lethal dose for a human adult. And you can see that's 100 milligrams and the maximum yield from a copperhead never gets there. But you can see with a cotton mouth and with the timber rattlesnake, the, the, venom, the high venom yield, the high end of that venom yield is higher than what the maximum lethal, the estimated lethal dose for a human is. That doesn't mean every bite from a rattlesnake, a timber rattlesnake or an eastern cotton mouth is, is fatal, but it certainly means they are medically serious and you need to get treatment right away, even with a copperhead, because you don't know how you're going to react if you've never been bit before. Um, but you can see the, this, what this, this bar chart here tells you is the copperhead is the least venomous of our three venomous snakes. So, and um, they, their bites rarely lead to fatalities. Um, I'm not saying it's a fun time and you're going to enjoy having your, your forearms swell up like uh, Popeye in the cartoons. Um, it's, it's probably going to be painful, but um, they're, they're very rarely fatal, which is a little bit of good news. I hope that we can all agree on that. Um, a venomous snake bite. Now, now I'm going to show you some skulls in a minute. And you'll see it's not always true that it's two punctures. It's two punctures for a venomous snake versus a non-venomous snake. But our three snakes in the in the estate, our three venomous snakes uh, that you'll find in the state are all pit vipers, and they do have this kind. Of, they would have this kind of uh, appearance with their snake bite. And that that hand's also supposed to look really swollen. Um, one of our one of our other staff members got tagged by a rat snake once, and she had this exact. Um, tooth pat uh, bite pattern on her hand after she got bit. Um, so like you can definitely vouch for that one. Um, so these are uh, egg lift. This is a kind of um, teeth arrangement and skull. Uh, this is a lot of the colubrid snakes, which include the garter snakes have this. Um, as I mentioned, they're actually mildly venomous. Um, they have something called the Devornoy's, Devornoy, that gland that starts with a capital D. I've tried that so many times. Um, and it does produce a mild venom. It's not considered a venom gland, or it is considered a venom gland, depending on the scientist you talk to. Uh, and there's still a lot of discussion on the evolution of venom glands and, and what these different, um, uh, excuse me, what these different glands do. But it, there is a distinction made between this gland, which you'll find in, in garter snakes and some of other closely related snakes, versus the venom glands you'll find in things like cobras and uh, the pit vipers. Um, this is an epistoglyph. Um, this is actually what's sometimes called a rear fang snake. OK, so their fangs are towards the back of the mouth. And so they actually have to get the prey in their mouth and arrange them to the back. Before they can envenomate. One of the snakes that does this is the boom slang. This is a snake from Africa. It is a seriously venomous snake. Um, and even though it has to, that sounds like a lot of stuff, they can do that very, very quickly to arrange that, um, the prey in their mouth to get it to the back where they can envenomate it. And uh, they are, um, a, a, like I said, a very venomous snake. You do not want to get bit by this snake. Uh, there was a famous herpetologist named Carl Schmidt who was handling one and it bit him and he insisted that he didn't need medical care, that they, they couldn't possibly be that venomous because they were rear fang uh, and he died because he didn't get medical care uh, and he didn't realize what he was dealing with, which is an unfortunate end because uh, he was a pretty good uh, herpetologist, um, but he was he was done in by a venomous snake. They are, and you can see they're green. They are um, a snake that hangs out in trees, um, uh, but they're African, so you don't have to worry about those around here. Proterglyph, you can see we're getting, starting to get to the point where we got these front fangs 
which is what I think most people think of when they think of venomous snake. But believe it or not, that's not a very big fang. It had, there's a groove, but it's not completely uh, an enclosed canal to for the venom to travel through. There's just a, a groove, and the venom goes down that groove. <coughs> uh, but some of the cobras have this, and um, if you ever heard of a spinning cobra, they actually have a, um, a hole at the bottom that allows the snake to then jet that venom into the air at a uh, potential uh, prey, or, and certainly as, as a defensive maneuver as well. And you don't want to get that venom, especially in your eyes or somewhere where it can um, get into your body and start to, to be a problem. Um, I had a note here. And then uh, this guy on the right is a coral snake. I, I think we can recognize that. Uh, they tend to be actually fairly um, timid. They're not very aggressive. They'd rather run and hide than, than give you a bite in their rear fang uh, as well. I think they only like 20, 25 people a year get bit by them, uh, but they do have some some pretty serious uh, venom. If I remember correctly, they can actually affect your ability to breathe. Uh, so you want to get um, checked out right away if you have one of those. And then these selenoglyphs, which is um, more typical of what you'll find in our pit vipers, like the copperhead and the rouse. Um, you know, I like to... Some of you that heard me talk before know I like to go far afield and pull in some really odd examples of this. One of the members of this family is called the stiletto snake. This is a fossorial snake from Africa. Uh, fossorial means they spend a lot of time, you know, under rocks or logs or in, in, the, in the ground even, uh, under leaf litter, you know, really concealed. Well, these guys hunt in tunnels and there's not a lot of space to rear back and strike in a tunnel. So what they can actually do with their fangs is stick their fang out laterally to the side and stick their head to one side or the other to puncture and envenomate their prey. Uh, and that's how they're able to use these long fangs in a very enclosed space like a tunnel. Um, just crazy. I, it's, a, it's an amazing adaptation. Um, but this is, you, this, you can see in this image, it's much more typical of what we see with rattlesnakes. You've got this, um, this long uh, fang. It has a canal that the venom travels through in order to get where it's being injected. Uh, and there's a protective sheath and they can actually fold this uh, fang against the inside their mouth with using this compressor. Oh, the compressor muscle, sorry, it's for the venom gland. But they can, um, they have other muscles to fold this fang in so they can um, not puncture themselves. And, you know, they don't walk around looking like a saber tooth snake so that the fang is completely enclosed in their mouth. And snakes can open their mouth really wide. One of the things I forgot to mention about the boom slang, boom slang is, again, because it's rear fang, it can open its mouth almost 170 degrees, uh, which is really, really wide. Um, and this is why you don't want to get bit by a copperhead. Uh, this uh, poor gentleman, I think, got tagged maybe twice, and so his his leg is really, really swollen. Uh, you can't really see the puncture marks. I think this might be where he got bit. Um, uh, he's obviously in the medical treatment facility, uh, and you'll recover, but, you know, it can be painful. Oh, I'm sorry. There's the bite right there. It's nice and circled with the two puncture wounds. Um, I think this is, yeah. Um, I think when people walk out in the woods, the, the fear is that the snakes are everywhere and they're just waiting for them to get a chance to get at them. Um, the snakes don't want an interaction with you any more than you do with them. If you stay on trails and, uh, you know, and trails are nice and open, you have a far less likely chance to see a copperhead um, in our parks than if you go off trail. You know, off trail, you've got a lot of leaf litter, you've got a lot of areas where that coloration of the copperhead can make them very concealed and very difficult to spot. If you're walking on a trail that's an open area, you know, with a natural surface, whether it's, it's dirt, whether it's um, uh, uh, the, the bark the, the bark that we put down, you know, whatever it is, you have a better chance of, of seeing them on there. Uh, and that's what I always like to tell people. If you stay on the trail, you, you have less like chance to see them. I've never seen a copperhead from the trail, uh, whether off the side or on the trail. I know some people have, so I can't say it's impossible, but it, it's, it's far less likely. Um, if I go tramping off trail, especially through a lot of leaves, I, I try to get myself a stick and wiggle the leaves and make sure they don't wiggle back before I, I head out in there. Um, but yes, there, we do have copperheads in the in the park. And it, it, but if you take care and, and you make smart decisions, you keep your eyes open and remember that they are part of the landscape and you need to keep an eye out for them, uh, I think you'll be fine. Um, I'm going to send a follow-up email with a survey. Uh, I'm at, it's at eight o'clock and I want to respect people's time and also take some questions, but I'll send out a, a survey um, 
uh, tomorrow or over the weekend. I'm going to try to throw a few links in there for other resources about Comprehensive if you have more questions. Um, one of the ones I will say is the Virginia Herpetological Society is fantastic. They have a great website about all of Virginia's uh, amphibians and uh, reptiles, and they have a great uh, document on there under the Copperhead tab about um, living in Copperhead country and you know traveling or hiking through Copperhead country, the things you can do to protect yourself, and I highly recommend checking those out. Um, if there were tips in here that you don't remember, um, you can watch the video again. I'll be posting it up um, later this week. Or uh, I have a shorter version. It's just the um, the ID tips that I posted on YouTube and Facebook uh, a couple days ago. You can check that as well. Um, I want to thank everybody for coming and, and spending your time with me this, this Thursday evening. We had a big crowd and hope everybody was able to see and hear me properly. Um, but it's 801 and if you need to go, please feel free to do so. I'm going to hang around for questions for a little bit and see if anybody has any. Um, but thank you everybody. I appreciate your time. Ken, we've had um, two questions that we just didn't have a chance to ask. Um, okay. Some folks, Oliver in particular, is wondering um, how many eggs a copperhead typically lays and how long they take to hatch. Okay, so they don't lay eggs because when they produce the, their young, their young stand side, so they're ovoviviparous, so they never actually lay eggs like some other snakes. Um, they can have, I, if I remember the numbers correctly, it's like between three and 14, um, but it's typically three to five young that they'll give live birth to. Uh, and they're not the only ones to do this. There's, there's several snakes that do this. Like I said, the, our copperhead, uh, copperheads, our garter snakes will also do that. I don't remember if the water snakes do, but I think they will. But like our rat snakes are egg layers. They will definitely lay eggs, I'll lay a clutch of eggs somewhere. Um, and they're not very good parents. Once they lay them, I think they take off. Some snakes will hang out, but some will take off. So, so Oliver is also wondering um, if a copperhead breaks a fang or damages a fang in some way, is that fatal to the snake? Well, they got two. So that's a really good question. Um, I don't know. If that's fatal, it depends on on the damage to the rest of the snake's mouth. But if the if the fang breaks off and it uh, and that heals, uh, I think they'll be okay. I don't. I doubt they'll grow it back. Um, but if they got one fang, they could probably still catch some food. Um, if the the one thing the copperhead could do is switch to smaller food. They'll you know if it's a bigger prey, um, you bite it, you let it run away, it gets sick, you find it and you eat it. But if um, it's a smaller prey, sometimes the copperhead will hang on to it once it's bit it until it um, succumbs to the venom and then swallow it. Um, our copperhead here, when we feed it, we give we have mice that are already deceased um, because a live mouse or rat can really do damage to a snake and can really hurt it. And we will, um, you know, hold the mouse in until this, the copperhead bites the mouse. And the copperhead will wait as if it's waiting for the venom to take effect because it doesn't really realize that the mouse is dead. Uh, sometimes they'll even do a little loop around its uh, enclosure before it comes back to it. Um, so that's, you know, instinctual. It's a really important um, uh, method for them to catch their food. But I would imagine a one fang copperhead still has a chance. How well it's doing is another story, how well it can act do hunting, but they still would have a chance. If they damage both fangs, I think that would be closer to fatal than, than damaging one. Okay. Two more questions have come in. Um, Sure. Oliver is wondering again about mother snakes and if the mother stay with the young at all or she just, you know, has her young and heads out on her own. And then Jennifer wants to know, what should you do if you see a copperhead? That's a really good question. Um, I meant to, to, to take a look at that and see. If, if you could tolerate it, that's one thing. Um, one of the things in that document I mentioned from the Virginia Herpetological Society is that um, it talks about how to do things in your yard that make your yard less I don't say pleasant, but less perfect for snakes. Uh, one of our neighbors called me um, that they had a, a copperhead hanging out in their backyard. Well, she had a, a rock wall and the rock and there was gaps between all the rocks. It's a perfect place for copperhead. It's also a perfect place for the food they eat. Um, and so, you know, once they find a spot like that, hey, well, I go anywhere. Um, and so if you've got one in your yard, if there's a certain place they're staying, that's, you know, figure out a way to, to change that or get, get um, uh, make it less excitable for the copperhead. Somebody else I knew found one in their mulch bucket. You know, they were mulching in the backyard and there was copperhead who was like, this is nice and warm. And it is, you know, it's a great place to stay. And so if you can figure out a way to make that 
I guess, snake proof or at least snake resistant. That's the way to do it. Um, if you're you've got one in your yard and you want to get rid of it, um, you could try to call an animal warfare link, but I don't think they they deal with copyrights because they're they're wild, and so you might have to call um, a wildlife specialist or an animal removal expert. Um, I am going to work on that question and get back to you. So if you have a question, if you find a copyright in your yard, please give us a call uh, and we'll see if we can help you out. I don't know we can, but I, I just rather not see the animal die if it could be, if we could find somebody that could relocate it rather than just put it in the bucket and kill it later. Um, again, part of the reason I wanted to do this is there's a lot of talk in the neighborhood about copperheads. I know there's a couple sightings here in the park. Um, I think people get a little anxious about having a venomous snake in the area. Um, and I just want to make sure that snakes that aren't venomous aren't getting whacked because people think they're copperheads. But I also want to make sure that copperheads, you know, that we can, you know, protect and preserve because they are part of the ecosystem. And it'd be a shame to not have them here, uh, even though they, they can pose obviously a medical threat and you want to make sure that you're aware of them. What was Oliver's other question? I don't know if I an answered it. <laughs> Sorry, Maddie. <laughs> Oh, you're muted. No, Maddie, you're muted. <laughs> That's OK. I can't read lips very well. There you go. Sorry, the computer keeps freezing over here, so we're having a little bit of a delay. Okay. Um, so um, Oliver was wondering if the mother copperhead stays with the young at all. I, and I, yeah, I think briefly, but not for very long. I think once they're out and it's they're kind of on their own. Um, there are you know different levels of parental care in nature and in, in different animals um there are some snakes that will lay eggs but then stay with the clutch and protect them until they hatch and then they're out you know and sometimes you know um other snakes they you know, they lay the eggs and they're gone or they they give live birth to the young and they're gone um my uh, the first time i learned about oviviparity was when i was in grade school and I would catch snakes every summer and keep them and my dad one year built this cage it was awesome it was a big glass piece and a wood two by four frame and screens on the end and a lid that we could lock so the snakes could get out because we had a cheap one before and all the snakes got out and I was so bummed and I come out one day and you know it's just a garter snake but it's a big garter snake it turns out it was a female and I come out and there's a worm wiggling out underneath through the slats at the bottom because we put dirt in it's just some law some uh, boards, but we put dirt in to kind of keep it there. And I pull it out and look, I'm like, that's a that's a baby snake. And our garter snake had given birth to 22 or 24 little snakes. Uh, and I have a picture somewhere of me with a crew cut because it's summer and this white um, frisbee with all these little wriggling snakes on it. I'm holding them like this. Um, and that was the first time I learned about this. I had no idea because I'm like, I never saw the eggs. I was so bummed. Uh, but they don't. They keep them all inside. But I mean, 22 you know, 20 some youngsters in still inside of her, you know, and that's why the females are, are you know, larger because either producing the eggs or, you know, maintaining them inside. So, um, but again, I think once they're out, the garter snake was like, you do your thing. You know, she didn't seem overly concerned when I was plucking them out of the, the cage there. So. All right, we've got um, two more questions. Zachary sure. is wondering if snakes can blink and if they don't have eyelids, do they sleep with their eyes open? Yes. They don't have eyelids. They sleep with their eyes open. What snakes have, and this is fantastic, is um, a scale that covers their eye, and the scale is, uh, is transparent. So it's like having a permanent glass over your eye. Now, the downside to that is when a snake sheds um, and gets ready as the uh, old skin uh, separates from their body, they get very dull. Well, their eyes will blue over. They'll start to look kind of blue, and that means the snake is getting ready to shed. Excuse me. And so uh, you'll have a snake that just it looks like it's got these two blue eyes. Um, and that's and again, that's an indicator they're going to shed. Uh, and that is the actual scale coming away from the eyes. And once they get to that point, they kind of hide. They're very listless. They're they're quick to strike at shadows because they can't really see what's going on until they can shed. Uh, and so I think it's probably really a, a relief for them to shed because it's probably also itchy. But the first time they can shed and they crack that skin and it peels back off their eye, <gasps> I can see again. You know, it's got to be really exciting. Um, but yeah, and they have and then they've got a new scale over that eye. Again, it's trans, uh, it's transparent, so you can't see it. So. I'm sorry to all the Harry Potter fans, 
but every again every time i see that first book and the snake winks at harry potter and says, come on could have found an answer on wikipedia real easy uh but yes yeah, snakes do not blink um they they have um a scale over their eye so their eyes are open all the time so and i don't know if that means they'll hide their head under one of their coils while they're sleeping so that you know they don't see the light or they don't have that kind of um uh in stimulus but i'd imagine the brain probably shuts it out at some point while they're sleeping um although it certainly doesn't hurt to keep people from sneaking up on you while you're sleeping all right one last question are there any birds that eat copperheads that's a fantastic question uh i don't know that's a really good question i don't know we certainly have a lot of hawks and and there there's some of our hawks are not very picky um who would be a predator to i'm trying to see if i can find a book and cheat because why not um who would be a predator to the copperhead uh because again that venom is a really good reason to not try to eat a copperhead uh let's see copperhead by the way I'm, uh the book i'm looking in is a fantastic book uh, wildlife of virginia and maryland in Washington DC uh, and it's a really good book with a lot of interesting um, stuff on there it's not it's not jumping out to me what might eat them and maybe he doesn't have it written in here oh uh, here we oh yeah, yeah I can't believe anything of this uh, king snakes and uh, racers are both snakes that eat other snakes uh, and they tend to be immune to the venom so they will attack and eat copperheads we don't have king snakes around here we do have racers but maybe not close uh, milk snake. It does say hawks will prey on copperheads, um, which is interesting. And shrews, moles, and opossums will take juveniles. Um, and opossums are just really, I got to do a deep dive on them one day because they're just really uh, amazing critters for as goofy as they can look. Uh, not that I'm picking on their looks, but um, uh, yeah. So again, and, and it, you've got to have some kind of resistance to that venom if you're going to prey on a venomous snake. Uh, and I know for sure king, king snakes do because they'll eat you know depending on what venomous snakes are on they'll even eat rattlesnakes uh, which is pretty impressive you can look that up on uh, uh probably youtube certainly in google images to find uh king snake eating uh, another snake it's pretty impressive oh you yeah, sure anybody else any other questions that's it fantastic thanks everybody it was wonderful seeing you all or i didn't really see you all but maybe you heard me so uh it was wonderful being out i, I love doing these presentations and uh i got another one next um uh, friday on parasites uh you can look that up on the uh, parks and rec website and sign up and um yeah thank you uh i'm gonna say goodbye i'm gonna hang out in another second too uh but if if you're ready to go by all means please go uh and thanks again Oh, I see some applause. You're too kind. Hey, Betty, go ahead Thank and unmute. You, yeah, no problem. It's good seeing you. Is Eggie home or is she you. still on the bout? I tried to get her on camera. She just ran away. <laughs> Tell her I said hi. I will. Thanks. Have Appreciate you guys coming. You too. Thank you. All right. Well, thanks, everybody. A few people on there. Uh-oh. Hi. <laughs>